want you to turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to go deeper in the life of John the Baptist. John chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 22. We're going to see what a radical for Jesus looks like. We read about his diet. <laughs> we read about the crazy things he would do. I, I, I pray God doesn't call me to eat grasshoppers and locusts and honey. I wouldn't survive. I don't think I survive on a diet, normal diet. I'm trying. I'm really trying. I'm using my fitness pal. How many people are using my fitness pal? How many people just turn to the person, the person station and say, you need my fitness pal. You, you should be on a diet. Just turn to <laughs> as I get it. Let's all receive it now. <laughs> That's right. I, I lied to my fitness pal. I not lying to the Lord. You know, I said, how much did you eat right now? I said, none of your business. Nanya, Nanya business. You don't need to know this kind of stuff. I'll just bring it down to you know, 500 or you know, 300. <laughs> I know, it's really bad. Then I wonder when I stand on the scales, what's going on? Sorry. John chapter 3. I bought you some time. Let's read together the word. Reading from verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. I love that. People are constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I'm not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. Listen to these words, and I want you to underline this in your Bible. He must become greater. That's a hard word. I must become less. Let me just repeat that because we got to get this in our spirit. He must, must become greater. I must become less. Father God, this morning, the word that you are sharing with us goes against everything the world will throw at us, the propaganda that is played over and over on televisions, on the internet, on radios, that tells us and instructs us, think about yourself. It's all about you because you're worth it. But we declare, Lord God, no, you're worth it. We would not be here without you. We would not have the fortunes that we have without you. We would not have the jobs that we have without you. We would not have our health without you. And Lord, we acknowledge you this morning. Father, let the word that you want to speak to your church touch deeply inside our hearts, causing a shift to take place. For we agree with heaven today as we declare in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I'm reading this thing here, and I'm, I'm very interested. I found... Isn't it interesting that the trouble began not outside the camp. The trouble began with his own people. Did you notice that? His disciples were saying, everyone is going to him. You know that guy that you were prophesying about? This, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's taking all our business. You know, it's, it's interesting, like, we, we as pastors, there's a problem that pastors have. I want to acknowledge this before you that there can be an arrogance that comes with holding the mic. In fact, even when we're preaching, it can come across like, 
I've mastered this. Come and follow me. But can I declare to you today that we humbly have to work out this word in our personal lives every single day, just like you. And I pray that I can inspire you, but listen to what's going on here. Isn't it interesting that when trouble comes, it usually comes from your own camp, from your own tribe, from your own friends, from your own family. When trouble comes, it often comes first to the people closest to you. That God will stir them up. Some of them might even attack you. Some of them will speak behind your back. People you trusted. How many people know what I'm talking about? I'm not just speaking to a few. Okay, you've been hurt before. If you haven't been hurt yet, you wait your turn. It's coming. And then this lesson will be like, wow, I should have listened to that message a bit better. That was a good one. <laughs> That's right. I'm going to pray for you. The question here is, when you look at this, it's like, John, he's so good. I mean, have you, have you ever been good at something? You came to your workplace, you're the newbie, and it's like you could do things that no one else in this business could do, and you were the golden child. I mean, they loved you. Every, every idea you came up with, they're like, who is this golden child? I mean, it was like angels sang around you. Oh. Thus I declare we should do this. Oh, wow, that's amazing. They loved you. Every idea that came from your lips was treasured, and all of a sudden, they hired someone else. And they're better than you. And they're getting the attention, and they got ideas, and in fact, they're saying they're better ideas than the ones that you have. How do you react to that? <laughs> cry. Let's be honest, shall we? That's what we do. What happens when you're passed over? What happens when you're not the favorite kid of your parent and you realize they actually have a favorite? We don't do that in our family. We love them all equally, not equally. We all love them all individually. Think about what's happening in John the Baptist camp. Two weeks ago, I'm preaching about how incredible this man's ministry was. The Bible tells us people were coming from all over Jerusalem. They're coming from all over Judea. Everyone that lives along, along the Jordan Riverbanks are coming out to see this guy in the middle of a desert preaching up a storm. Let me tell you, this guy wasn't gentle. He's saying harsh words. Just listen to the message two weeks ago. And yet people were coming. Instead of setting them back, his harsh preaching, he's saying, I'm going to speak truth. I'm going to speak life to you. That if you take hold of these words, it will shift and change the fabric of your being until you more resemble what God requires of you, that you can live in the blessing and the favor of the Lord. And so people realize this guy speaks truth. Soldiers came to him and said, because he's saying, produce fruit in keeping with repentance and say, what is that to us? We're soldiers. What kind of fruit do you want from us? He says, you know when you, when you try and take money from people or you make them do stuff for you, don't take more than you're supposed to. Don't demand more from the people than you're supposed to. To others, they say, well, what do you want from us? And he says, if you've got two coats, give one away to a person who has nothing. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. God wasn't gentle at all. Teachers of the law, religious leaders are coming to check out this new guy on the block. I mean, he is famous. Thousands are coming out and flocking to the wilderness. Thousands. There's no PA. There's no amplification. There's no internet. There's no Twitter hashtag brood of vipers. There's nothing like that in that time period. And yet thousands would go out to see him. He had his own following. He had disciples. They called him. According to this passage, Rabbi, he was a teacher of the word, and he was worthy to be followed, worthy to be emulated, and his ministry was growing until, until. You know what, what's really challenging as I read this passage? It wasn't the devil that was contending against John the Baptist. Do you notice that? I think a lot of times we just blame the devil for stuff. The devil made me do it. The devil is coming against me. There's a conflict. And God, come down and smoke. <laughs> Do something. Send thunder and lightning. Change my circumstances and situations. Everyone holla, yes, Lord. But it wasn't the devil. 
In fact, it was Jesus. It was God himself doing this. Some of you are, you, you contend with God and you don't realize it because you are praying, God, remove this person from my presence. One of the most dangerous prayers I learned as an employee along the years was this one. I'll share it with you. You're welcome. Keep this one away. Tuck it away. Lord, improve or remove. You got a boss over your life that's a real jerk. You got that colleague that's a real jerk in your life. God, improve or remove and see what God does. But sometimes, and this is the thing about being humble before God and having a listening ear, it's recognizing that it isn't the devil and it isn't you, it's God. God put you there. Other times, it's not even that at all. But God wants to test the quality of your heart. How does a man of God? How does a woman of God respond to rejection? How does a man of God respond when someone gets the attention and you don't get the spotlight anymore? How do you deal with being passed over? How does the Bible talk about it? And we see this in the life of John the Baptist. His disciples are the ones that are arguing. Not Jesus' disciples arguing with his disciples. That wasn't happening at all. It was his disciples arguing with another guy over contention of ritual washing. They weren't arguing over the washing. They were arguing over the fact that they're worried that they're losing business. Think about this. People are coming from far and wide to hear John the Baptist, but now all that is changing. He's not the only one baptizing in the wilderness. There's another guy on the block, a new kid on the block, and he is baptizing people in the wilderness. More people are coming to him because there's something more about this guy. This is John the Baptist 2.0. It's an upgrade because this guy can tell stories. He can tell parables. And then when you ask him deeper, he has the answers. There's nothing he doesn't know. On top of that, this guy performs miracles. John the Baptist never did that. He's healing blind eyes. People are being raised up from the paralytic mats. Eventually, you'll see that people were raised from the dead. He's feeding people with food out of thin air. He's multiplying food. This guy has it all. John the Baptist 2.0. And this preacher doesn't yell at you. He's kind. He's gentle. He loves you. <laughs> Where's John the Baptist? You brood of vipers. I just love you, Jesus. I, you know, I just love you. It's a different kind of ministry, John the Baptist 2.0. The new preacher doesn't wear camel hair. New preacher doesn't eat grasshopper and locusts and honey like that's cool. He eats normal food. Like normal people. He dresses like normal people. I can be like Jesus because he's normal, not like this John the Baptist. How do you deal with jealousy? How do you respond when someone else is more successful than you? How do you react when your business is declining and someone else's get blessed? How do you react when their church is growing and you're struggling. This, this is a, keeping it real. You know, our challenge as people in this world is discovering who we really are. That's my one job. That's a pastor's one job. A preacher's one job to help you discover who you really are. The world is screaming at you. You don't even recognize it. It's trying to tell you who you are. They're telling you who you are. It's not who you really are, but they're trying to tell you this is who you are. This is who you are. This is who you are. Walk in, walk in this way thereof. But the Bible reveals who you really are. In this world, we go through cycles of challenges that come our way. And how you react to that trouble reveals the character of who you really are. And when trouble comes, according to science, your initial reaction is three things. When trouble comes, either run from it. You ever seen people do that? Hardship comes, they're gone. Brother, my 
My word is stronger than oak. I'll be with you through hell and high water. Next minute, hell comes and gone. <laughs> or some of them hide. You know, just when you need them, they're gone. And later on when everything is okay, oh, pastor, I'm with you all the way. Where were you when I needed you? Pastor, I want to help you with your load. I want to help you with your load. What load? The load I have is to call people and love people and visit people. I need you there. What do you think a pastor does? Or another reaction is we fight. We are geared in today's world to look for the easy. We're always trying to find the easy solution. We are looking for the comfortable, and we try and find ways to be even more comfortable. That's how we are designed right now, how we think. And we are bombarded with self-help tips so that we can look out for number one because we're worth it. But the kingdom of heaven is not about self-promotion. It's not about self-preservation. It's not about the pursuit of happiness. What is happiness? The Bible talks about joy, but it doesn't talk about happiness. You can't be happy all the time. See, the thing is, we set ourselves up to fail when we think, once you come to Jesus, everything's going to be okay. You'll be happy the rest of your life. i got news for you. <laughs> this many years outside of the timeline, it doesn't happen like that. But I have joy. I have joy. I'm so filled with joy. You know you're filled with joy? You're filled with hope, so much hope, because... You have to be because you're a people of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So you have to have hope. Evangelist Billy Graham once commented, Most of us suffer from spiritual nearsightedness. Our interests, our loves, and our energies are too often focused on ourselves. I was scrolling through Facebook a week ago, and I came across an old school friend's post as he shared this excerpt from the biography of missionary Helen Rosevere. This is what she writes. After 20 years in the Congo, suffering innumerable hardships, including rape, Helen is retiring and leaving the medical training school she pioneered. In her last month, the students she poured her life into accuse her of being a corrupt colonial oppressor. The staff cave into the pressure, and she is forced to resign just weeks before her retirement party. She writes... Quote, unquote, yet this was the privilege he offered, the privilege of being a missionary, his ambassador, identified with him among those whom he wanted to serve. That sounds really gracious, right? But it goes deeper. (laughs) Look at what happens. God begins to speak to her. He says this, you went home and told everyone that I was sufficient at that moment in those circumstances. Isn't this true now? In today's circumstances, I am sufficient? She tried to say, but of course, Lord, you know it's true. He says, no. He quietly rebuked her. He says, no, you no longer want Jesus only, but Jesus plus. Jesus plus respect, Jesus plus popularity, Jesus plus public opinion, Jesus plus success, Jesus plus pride, Jesus plus. You wanted to go out with all the trumpets blaring from a farewell do that you organized for yourself with photographs and tape recordings back in the day, to show and play at home just to reveal what you had achieved. You wanted to feel needed and respected. You wanted the other missionaries to be worried about how they'll ever carry on without you. You'd like letters when you got home to tell you how much they realize they owe to you, how much they miss you, all this and more, Jesus 
plus. No, you can't have it. Either it must be Jesus only, or you'll find you have no Jesus. If you want to know the title for this message, it's Jesus only. How do you make Jesus only? But Lord, you don't understand what they did to me. They stabbed me in the heart. They stabbed me behind my back. They were speaking behind my back. Do you know what they did to me? As if God is ever surprised. Let me give you three things to help you make Jesus only. If you're taking notes, here's the first one. Know your ability. The Bible says, a, John's reply, he's a man of God. He's saying, you know, jealousy, jealousy. They're trying to bait him. They're trying to make him jealous, but he doesn't bite. This is why. Number one, he says, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. In other words, John could not be swayed by his identity. He knew who he was. He knew what his role was. And he acknowledged that everything he received came from God. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Don't you think he knows what you need? In fact, the Bible tells us he even knows what you want, and he gives it to you. Right? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not the needs, the desires of your heart. God wants to bless you. But when we become jealous of someone, God can't bless you. Here's the thing that we struggle often to understand. Because we're trying to bat above our average. We're trying to be bigger than what we're really made to be. And we struggle with this. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't try hard to better yourself, increase your built abilities and talents. But often, more often than not, people try to be better, a better station than where they're at. I should be, I deserve, I de you know, they're not being mean to you, your boss, not giving you the promotion, just the other guy was better. That's all. If you want the promotion, what do you need to do? Become better. Oh, no, it's, it's the devil. <laughs> it's the devil in this one. I'm going to pray for this one. I'm going to fast and pray and contend that that sh No, it's, it is what it is. Now, God wants to see what's in your heart. How can you handle a rejection? This is a principle we need to understand in the kingdom. You cannot receive more than you can handle. The Bible tells us in Matthew 25, a parable of talents where a master brings his servants and he goes, I'm going away for a period of time, but I want to trust, entrust you with some wealth, okay? It's called the parable of the talents, and you're thinking it's talents and giftings. It can be. It was literally money. So he gave one servant five talents. Think like $50,000. He gave another one two talents and another one one talent. You know the story. The one with the five and the one with the two, they put their money to work. They began investing, and they were able to get a return double what was originally given to them. But the other servant, the singular one, the one with the one talent, he hid it. And the Bible says he had a wickedness of the heart saying, you're trying to get stuff out of me that you don't deserve. Here's your one talent. You gave me one talent, I'm giving you back one talent. The master was angry because God has an expectation of fruitfulness in our life. And the Bible tells us that God takes the talent from the person who had the one and gives a single talent not to the one who had two, but he gives it to the one who had five. Why? The Bible gives us this answer. In verse 15, he says, He gave to each servant talent, each according to his ability. You see, God cannot give you more than you're capable of handling. And if you're given more, it's going to be a waste. In fact, if God gives you more than you're capable of handling, it's going to end up badly. You're going to be shamed as people find out, this guy is useless. Look at what he had. Look what he brought it down to. So God won't do that to you because God wants to set you up for success. So if you're believing God for a job promotion, manage what you have well. If you're looking for more wealth, 
manage what little you have now. Begin to honor God. Rance was talking about pay your tithes, give your offering. Learn to manage what you have, and God will bless you. You want a better wife? Start looking after the one that God gave you. <laughs> there we go. All the ladies, that should, be, that should be that moment there. You're all quiet. Thank you so much, sis. I had one live one. Let me give you key number two. I'm, I'm running out of time. Okay, key number two. Know your purpose. So the first one, know your ability. This one is know your purpose. John the Baptist replies, he goes, the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy. He's trying to express to his disciples, he's saying, look, I know who I am. I know my purpose. I'm not meant to be the Messiah. I told you that from the very beginning. I'm like, if he was, he's the bride, a bridegroom, who's going to be united with his bride, my job is the friend. Now, a lot of us, we don't understand this, but in Jewish culture, there was a title for this guy. It's called Shoshben. Shoshben, okay? It means friend of the bridegroom. So his job was this. He was placed in charge of everything to do with the wedding. Everyone except for the bride and the groom had to listen to him. He's organizing the meal. He's organizing the wine. He's organizing the venue. He's organizing all the details from prep to the service, to the reception. And he was also the most trusted friend. This is what you call the best man. And so anytime the bridegroom wanted to send a message to the bride or vice versa, they called a friend. They called a shoshben. And he would take the details, those messages, and hand it because he was trusted. They knew the message would come exactly as he received it. It would be delivered the same way. And the most important job of all, straight after the reception, he would walk with the bride to the bridal chamber where she would go inside and change waiting for a husband to come in to consummate the marriage and he would stand as a guard in front of that doorway he would not let any would-be husband come in there but the real one he would stand and guard the place until the right man when he hears a bridegroom's voice he's filled with joy I've done my job it's complete now and he lets him in shuts the door and keeps everyone out F.B. Meyer was a famous preacher. People came from miles around to hear this guy preach in Northfield, Massachusetts. Large, large crowds thronged to hear him until the British Bible teacher G. Campbell Morgan came to Northfield, Massachusetts, and people were soon flocking to hear his brilliant expositions of Scripture. Meyer confessed that first he was envious so he said, the only way I can conquer my feelings is to pray for Morgan daily, which I do. I remember when we were launching um, a service. back. I was an associate pastor on the north side of Brisbane. We, um, uh, my senior pastor wanted me to start an international service. So we were going to start one in the middle of the week, and we began to pray and fast to hear from the Lord. You know, what, what does he want us to do? Lord, help us to do this. You put this on our hearts. We have to do it now. How are we going to do this? And We're praying and we're praying. I remember I had this vision. I saw a picture of a black net, and I saw a picture of a black trident capture, ca catching fish. And the Lord spoke to me because I said, Lord, what, why, why this? And he says, because you're going to, Paul, you're going to capture more than one fish. That's what the trident is for. It's not just one spear. It's got three or four or five different prongs capturing more than one fish. You're going to capture more than one. What about the net? The Lord says, because you're going to capture even more than like five. Or so. You're going to capture heaps of fish. God's, I'm going to bless you. And, but then I was troubled. I said, but Lord, why, why is the net black? And the Lord said this, you see all that beautiful fish? You notice you didn't, you didn't even see the net because it was black. Are you going to be okay if you're not noticed, but many come into the kingdom? At that, I hardly said, God, it would be my absolute thrill and pleasure to be unknown. Can we become the company of the unknown, making a difference in people's lives? Let me give you the third one. If I can get Katie to come up, please. The third key. The third key to how to make Jesus only is this. Make Jesus known. John the Baptist says, he must become greater. I must become less. So you can't just have God greater and you greater. Something's got to give. 
Because see, we're always fighting and contending. That's called idolatry. God is either Lord of all or not at all. He, he can't be equal to your family. Uh, this is going to sound like very contentious. You can't love God at the same level that you love your family. You can't love God at the same level as you love your wife. Well, hang on, Pastor, what are you saying? You can't love God as the same amount as you love your career. But, but I love God too. No, no, it's not too. That's idolatry. In fact, Jesus said it this way. He says, your love for me in comparison with your love for your wife, your love for your children, your love for your brother, your love for your sister, your love for your father, your love for your mother, you get it? He says, it's like hate, that you hate them. You love God and you hate your father. You love God, you hate your wife. Now, Jesus wasn't trying to preach a gospel of hate. What he's saying is, it's a metaphor. He's saying the intense difference in feelings and emotions between loving God and loving other things has to be so vast and so separate that the love in comparison looks like hate. Of course, we don't hate our wife. We're commanded, husbands love your wives. That'd be against God's nature. So he's not against what he's saying. What he's saying is, your love for God has to supersede everything else. Every sacrifice that you make, everything you can do. The Bible tells us the story of the rich young ruler who wanted to inherit eternal life because he realized something is missing from my life. Now keep this in mind. It says a rich young ruler, not rich old ruler. They're usually old. This guy is successful beyond success. No one could imagine that a young guy could become wealthy and become a ruler of a synagogue, basically the pastor of the church. This guy had it all, but he still knew something was missing. So he came to Jesus, and Jesus says, okay, you want to follow me? You want eternal life? Give up everything you have. Sell it all. Give it to the poor. Then you can come follow me. The Bible says he hung his head down in shame, and he walked away, and it finishes with this, because he was very wealthy. Your wealth can trap you. Your love for your career can trap you. He walked away. Now, we know, as you fast forward into the future, we don't even know his name. He didn't even count in the Bible. He made no difference in the world. And then he, the very thing that he wanted, eternal life, he lost it because he walked away from the one opportunity that he had. Leonard Bernstein, composer, arranger, and conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, was once asked which instrument was the most difficult to play. He said, the second fiddle. I get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no sec second fiddle, we have no harmony. Why is it we're constantly trying to be first fiddle? That belongs to God. He's the first fiddle. That belongs to whoever God appoints. That's the first fiddle. Are you going to be content being second fiddle? Let me finish with one last story, if I can get you to stand to your feet with me. When we were planting Live City Church, God began putting it in our hearts early. And we began talking about it. We, gave, we began fussing over it. We began praying over it. And the Lord spoke to me in one of my times of prayer. I'm, I'm just studying. I have to drive an hour to get to uni. And the Lord is speaking to me. He said this to me. He said, Paul, are you wanting to plant a church so that you'll have people hear you preach? And I, I began, I, I'm not, a, my children know this, my wife knows this, I'm not a crier, but my eyes began to well up with tears as I realized God would not ask me something that was not already in my heart. And I began to weep in my car as I realized the wickedness of my heart. I didn't, but there was an element I did. I said to the Lord, I'm prepared to give this all up. I really don't have to do this. I, I don't want to do this. It's all yours. Well, you know what happened next. History has it. We've planted this church. But God is going to come and ask you the same thing. Are you willing to play second fiddle? Are you willing to give up your rights to make Jesus' desires first in your life? Is it Jesus plus my career or Jesus only? Is it Jesus plus my comfort? 
or is it Jesus only? Is it Jesus plus my extra sleeping on a Sunday, or is it Jesus only? Is it Jesus plus or Jesus only? Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes?